What's up, everybody? Our El Avinu with fully deconverted, disenfranchising dogma for the greater good. Hey, thanks everybody for joining us. Just so you know, head over to fullydeconverted.com. You can find all our socials on there as well and uh, learn anything about fully deconverted that you want basically from there. So go check that out. Um, we also just published a great article. Um, and, well, before I get to that, let me know, let me let you know what our lineup is for the month. Um, so for the month of August, we have uh, persons coming on the show like uh, Anthony Magna Bosco, Bart Campolo, Jim Helton, uh, Brandon Long, Phil Ferguson, Sally Hunt, Steve Hill, Suris, The Skeptic, Susan uh, Gerbic, who we had yesterday, Tracy Harris, Rath James White. If you want to see any of those interviews, either tune in in the future or go catch them as we've already had some of them. Uh, Alex Connor, that sort of thing. All right. We just published an article today entitled, In the Beginning, God Created Misogyny. And men saw that it was good. It's a great article. Go check it out. Um, I, I was really excited to read it. It's a hard-hitting article, as usual. Hey, we're fully deconverted over here. Um, but at the introduction of that article, that brings me to our next guest. Mohammed, why are you an ex-Muslim? Oh, well, I can go for more than an hour on that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lee, it, it began with atheism, but if you look back into what, what I used to believe in, there's all sorts of please, reasons to just leave the faith, even if you don't yeah. become an atheist. Mm. You can become anything you want. You have a bunch of tons of reasons to, to leave that religion, but still, uh, the main reason was becoming an atheist. So it wasn't a problem with me regarding the religion itself. It was a problem with the concept of God, and okay. that led... To, the, uh, to abandoning religion altogether. So it was, usually people I meet are telling me about problems they had with their own faith that led them to think about the concept of God and then led them to atheism, for example. That's most people I've met. I've met. Uh, for me, it was, like, it was more of a, the concept of God and then back to looking into religion. I was like, oh, like all of the evidence was there. Well, because it was so holy, you just can't see it. So tell me more uh, about that than your perceptions about God. What are you talking about? I mean, um, uh, when I began to, to have my doubts or to, to wanting to discuss theology more with people, especially of other faiths, yeah. now as a Muslim, uh, I... Uh, Consider yourself like living in a, in a box, so you can't see the whole world. You have to just get yourself outside of that box and look at the whole picture. So if I am to prove Islam, or mm -hmm. I, at least the Sunni sect, yeah. is like a smaller circle even within that circle. So if I have to prove the Sunni sect, I have to prove Islam at, at the first step. I yeah. mean, I have to prove religion as a first step. Well, how about proving God as a first step? So that's where I began. And when God collapsed, I was like, okay, if I go back into the, the Sunni sect and I go back into that religion, I should be finding problems. And that's what I did. But those problems were not so obvious when I was in the mentality of like, oh, I have the perfect message, the perfect book, and the perfect uh, human example. So that's, so, what, that's what led me to, into becoming an, an ex-Muslim. How long ago was it that you was, became an ex-Muslim? I think five years now or six actually. Yeah. Would you have considered yourself devout uh, for most of your adulthood? Not most of my adulthood, but for the past, like the, the last two years of uh, the last two years of my life as a Muslim, were devout. Mm. Like praying five times a day, mostly at the mosque. Um, all the whole idea of um, the caliphate, the implementing sharia and that that's the only path that we can go into back into the greatness we once had mm. um all of this it's like a, a um we were fed this identity that's uh, your your muslim identity is much more important than being a jordanian a saudi arabian uh, an american yeah. anything so 
this is your main identity. And once you cling into that, you, you feel like you belong into something. And when I did that for the past, for the last two years of me be, being a Muslim, that was, that just took over me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Same here. Um, I wonder what kind of trend this is for persons becoming uh, devout before certain deconversion experiences. I know I became very um, insistent on mm -hmm. asking questions, diving deeper into my faith. I deconverted uh, within the last year. In fact, you and I met at the atheist, American Atheist Convention. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not even out. No, I had just come out. I had just come out. And uh, so it was very inspiring hearing you speak there, by the way. And I think most people were moved and very interested in, to hear what you had to say. And I want to hope to tap into that a little bit during this interview so that my audience presently um, can hear a little bit of that. Uh, with that said, uh, Islam, Islam is a religion made up of mostly moderates, non-extremists. Um, aren't you worried that your advocacy, and for, and for the audience who doesn't know, I'll let you fill them in as, as pleases you, but aren't you worried that your advocacy will do more to endanger the lives of those who exist in communities alongside those who are willing to execute them for apostasy? Well, think about that. The, when World War II ended, did the United States and the Soviet Union and all of the Western allies, did they go into Germany and just shoot every, every German there who supported Nazi Germany or everybody who left there? Did they even go there and rounded up people? And Because at that point, millions and millions of Germans believed in that idea. Mm. But still... Those, those countries fought the idea itself, fought the heads of those ideas, fought the advocates of, the, of those ideas. They didn't mm. fight normal people who you meet every day. The, yeah. Even soldiers within the Nazi army just went home and started their new lives. Not everybody got in jail because of what, they, what happened. So when mm. I speak about a bad idea, <coughs> such as Islam, it doesn't mean that I'm putting millions and billions of people into a threat. I'm, I'm speaking yeah. about a thought, and if I cannot speak about a thought, because certain individuals would think that it's some kind of uh, racism or encouraging uh, such acts, well, go ahead, feel what you want, but still, call the truth what it is, call the bad idea for what it is, even if it would upset people, or even if it would encourage something, well, let's say, let's say it does, well, is the other side doing anything to proclaim that these ideas are not within the religion itself? Like, would somebody come in and be like, what, like have you ever seen thousands and thousands of marches that are protesting against ISIS? But you can see thousands and thousands filling the streets of Paris because of a cartoon, you know? Yeah. So it's, it, it doesn't seem to me that it's one of the main concerns of those millions. It's not those millions, some of them are family members of mine. So to claim that I somehow have a hate for every single Muslim in the world, well, you just have to look back and like, to me, I'm not like a white guy who, who was born in the United States and I lived there all my life and I'm just talking about Islam. I'm the guy who even was a Muslim, who had family members, who was married to a Muslim, who had all, all of the, his society is based on people who are Muslim. Some of them are friends, some of them are not. But it doesn't mean that the idea they believe in is fault and sometimes evil. So let's stop right there then and, and let's make sure our audience is kind of aware of your activism background. What do you do? How are you involved in this? Well, I started the Atheist Community of Jordan five years ago when I first became, became an atheist. There was no uh, public interaction. It was all in, in social media. with Why? Fake names. Hmm? Why? Well, because the law for blasphemy, you can get to three years in prison. The Sharia law, you can be put to death for apostasy. Okay, so, so you're taking your movement online. You started a, your activism online. Go from there. Yeah, we, start, we started with a Facebook group, and we started chatting there and talking, and then we decided to meet, and we did for a few times, and then it began to be monthly, which created a, a space where people can just be who you are, because... 
when you're living in that area, you have to fake that you are a Muslim. You have to fake certain acts and certain activities. You have to fast, even though you're not, because you, you cannot come out completely into society and be like, hey, I don't believe in this, because you, you're putting not... You're not putting your speech on the line. You're not even putting uh, people's feelings. You're putting your own life on the line when you do so. So were so, you encouraging discourse or were you encouraging some sort of public action? I was, first of all, I was encouraging social interactions between, between those who feel that they're the only Jordanian who left Islam. Yeah. So that turned into like a, a social club. That's yeah, and then and then the, we were we had a few movements that came from that movement who did some Facebook pages and and groups and universities where they were encouraging science, not based not not like strictly evolution or arguments yeah. about God existence, but just an idea of being educated and questioning yeah. whatever you were taught as a kid into the into those people so that they can be like. At one point, when somebody comes and tells you, like, oh, you should carry a gun and go to Iraq, you'll be like, oh, wait a minute, I have to question this, mm -hmm. you know? <clears throat> so that was, that's what started the whole community in Jordan. And afterwards, I went to London in 2017, gave a speech there, and then went back to Jordan. And that speech got viral, and then people at work started to know about it. And then the owner of a company got me in, and he was like, "Well, what is this?" And you, of course, with the whole agenda of like you're getting paid by the Jews and the Illuminati and the, <laughs> the, the Mossad is is planning to cripple Islam, and yeah. And at that moment, I decided that I should go back to the United States. I was actually born in the U.S., but I never lived here, so we lived all my life in Jordan. And that was the moment where I decided to just move back here a few months ago. Okay. So I'm picking up that it's not the safest thing to do to announce yourself publicly as either a non-Muslim or an atheist even, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in the middle of streets. And Jordan might be one thing, um, but then other places like Saudi Arabia might be a little bit different, right? Yeah. Um, and then fill our audience in really quickly on some of the legal procedures that can happen uh, if you're an apostate. Well, first of all, I'd like to point out that it, it's okay to be an unbeliever if you were not at one point of your life a Muslim. So it's gotcha. okay to be a Christian, it's okay to be an atheist, it's okay to be mm -hmm. whoever you want, although you do not have any civil rights because you do have civil rights if you are a Christian, but you don't have any civil rights if you're neither a Christian or a Muslim because there's only two courts. There are like just the Sharia court and the Christian court. Mm -hmm. So if you are, let's say, a Jew, for example, you cannot go into a civil process where you can marry or inherit or do all of that. You have to pick one. Uh, so it's okay to be a Christian. It's, you're okay to convert, for example, from Christianity to Islam. That's completely fine. Mm -hmm. It's not okay to convert from Islam to Christianity. Uh, That's a no-no. You can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> there are even some cases where even Christians, because the, the Christianity there is is a lot more strict than in the West. So yeah. there are even Christians who got killed because of them converting to Islam. It's not just like all all in one way. But it's well, how about that? My goodness, <laughs> some people are actually taking this seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Too seriously, it's like, oh, you want to convert? I'll cut his head, you know. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, uh, for the legal proceeding, if you, if somebody, anybody in society can file a lawsuit against you as for being an apostate, even if you haven't said anything about the religion, so you're yeah. not blaspheming, you just don't believe. So they can file a lawsuit against you in Jordan, and they can take away those civil rights because you lose the Muslim part of your ID, so you cannot go to the Sharia court. So you cannot do any papers. Even if you are married, the Sharia, the Sharia court will divorce you against your will. Wow. That, so that's in Jordan. In Saudi Arabia, the laws are strictly more Sharia because these are like secular laws that's named mm -hmm. them in Jordan. Uh, and blasphemy is three years. In Saudi Arabia, its apostasy is punishable by death. Atheism is a terrorist act under the terrorism law. Uh, which which got right, but that with the ten years of prison and the one thousand lashes, 
In Iran, it's also punishable by death. I, I think it's in 13 countries in the Muslim world where it's, it's punishable by death. All, all, uh, and it's also for homosexuality. I think 12 for homosexuality. I don't know the exact number. But the problem is not by laws. It's not about the legal proceeding. It's about people because uh, those who carry out the order to kill whoever leaves is not necessarily the government. And most of the time, it's not even the government. It's the mobs of people who believe that they're doing the will of God. So what happens example, when a mob decides to take it upon themselves to execute on Sharia law? What does the government do in response to that? I mean, do, are, do they kind of do they turn a blind eye? Do they say, no. hey, well done, good and faithful servant? Do they say, oh. hey, we must do this officially. Please don't do that again. Like what happens? No, they do act. They do act as if they're because they one of the things those dictatorships have is um, they're willing to, to, to please their Islamic opposition or the Islamic majority of the country, mm. but they agree we're like, oh, but we still dictate whatever goes. So if yeah. you want to go to the streets and implement whatever law you want, we won't allow it. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. So, for example, the guy who killed Nahid Hattar in 2016, he shot him while he was on blasphemy charges. So he was already going to be convicted for three years. Yeah. But a, but a Muslim imam came to him, shot him and killed him at, in the court, like outside the court. And the, and the government got the killer, executed the killer. But that doesn't mean that you do not live the, the threat of like, okay, let's say, for example, you're an atheist and, and a guy comes and threatens you. He wants to kill you. Well, if you want to go to the government for help, for protection, what are yeah. you going to say? You're going to be like, oh, this guy's threatening me. Well, why is he threatening you? Because I said this, this, and about the prophet. Yeah. You know, you can't even do it. So you can't, the government, you can't run to the government. You can't run to the people. You have nowhere to go. So that's why you might need a community of people who are like you to try to help you as much as they can. And uh, so, and this means staying secret. It's staying basically secret. Yeah. People okay. choose to speak to a degree. I chose to speak, but not not completely. Uh, some people are living completely secret. Some people are even parliament members. Some people are doctors. Some people are your everyday policemen, but they can't. You risk your job. You risk your family. You risk you're risking all of your life because of the, of a thought within your mind. And you now, after mentioning all of that, go back to the question you asked me when we first started. Is it really worth it mm. to not speak about this when you're, especially in the United States, like now, right now I am, is it worth it not to speak about it because I'm um, uh, in increasing whatever hate there is mm. for people because I'm speaking about a bad idea that's doing that to people who believe what I believe in? So, okay, so... People that are familiar with you and the places overseas um, in the Arab countries that are enforcing Sharia law, that are familiar with your work, how in touch are you with those communities? Like, do you have a finger on the pulse to know that if you're going to do advocacy or activism, anything anti-Islam, um, that you're kind of aware of the consequences that that community is going to experience? especially if they're found out or there's uh, an association tied to you. H help me out with what that kind of looks like because I, I get that change needs to occur. Like we're not trying to not trust our government and not trust our neighbor simply because we don't believe the same things. We might be found as an apostate and somebody's going to kill us or we're going to go to jail. I get that that needs to change. Um, are you keeping a finger on the pulse over there to know what kind of effect you're having? Well, um, basically, after the London speech, I, I began, began to be uh, more detached from direct communication with yeah. my friends and uh, people who I even wanted to be uh, connected to. They now refuse to be connected with me because now I've reached a level, a level where I'm too known. Yeah. So uh, that's why I started a website in, in a way that would not link anybody to me. 
Right. So I can provide that help. <coughs> but all, uh, whatever left of the connections I had after the London speech are all gone away after after moving out. So what now, do you do now? Like, how, how does an activist like you, who is in a position to be an ex-Muslim and be vocal about it, how, how do you even go back to your community now and, and try to affect change, which, you know, perhaps you don't want to do because it might put you in danger presently. But now what do we do? Like, this is the problem then with, um, with the Arab nations enforcing Sharia law. Uh, like, you've thought about this more than I have. What do we do? Well, for example, there's a friend of mine, Faisal Mutar. He, what, what he does is translating books such as like Sam Harris, for example, and providing them in Arabic online. A lot of ex-Muslims have translated uh, Richard Dawkins' books, which he agreed to provide for free to the Middle East. Uh, we have some initiatives uh, like uh, the ones I mentioned to you, the, the scientific initiatives, which are not necessarily illegal because they're not provoking anything, but basically putting a little bit of doubt and thought into people. So you can't be like, oh, we're the group of atheists who are going to march the streets and debate everybody we meet. We can't do that. Mm. But you can still speak as you have freedom of speech here for those people who have no voice. And that's what basically I'm doing here. And you can also try to get whatever resources you can from this area to, to fund or help in these programs that are directing, directed toward that area. Like, if it, for example, uh, you mentioned uh, Anthony, for example, one of the things I'm glad that I'm able to do in the past few days is translating the, his speech in Oklahoma City to let Arab atheists learn about uh, his method of yeah. talking with religious folks and putting that little bit of doubt within their method of, of preaching the truth. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, whether it's translating, whether it's helping those who are in danger to get out of wh wherever country or area they are at, whether it is funding the programs that do so and, and advocating for them and such organizations, all of these collaborated together as well as speaking, just giving those people a voice all would help just even if it not financially even if it's not by safety just by the he by hearing that somebody is actually able to talk and does talk mm -hmm. when i was back there in jordan i felt a, a, a sense of uh, gratitude to the people who did so in london who did so in the united states well i couldn't do so when i was back in jordan so i'm basically doing what i what i felt gratitude what i felt like I wanted to thank those people for doing so. Now I have the ability to do so myself. Yeah. How do they feel? Um, over on the live stream, we, somebody asked, how does the Jord uh, Jordanian atheist community feel about your departure from there? Are you over here for good? Or are you going back? What's, how are you keeping your affiliations there? Are you cut off? Well, but basically, I think I'm here for good. Last time, last time my friend sent me a, some money got in got in trouble with the police for, for doing so but, and i got into some questioning so i doubt that i'll be able to ever go back there yeah but the connections as, I, as i've said are still there but to a limit like i cannot directly speak it just just like i'm speaking to you yeah with anybody who, who who's still back in jordan even if you see the the video we did the other day that was created while i was here yeah see all of their faces are you can't even know their voices you can't know their names so it's just one guy back in, uh, from Jordan who can just show his face and speak while the others can do what, what they do back on the ground how familiar are you, are you familiar with Al Jazeera Al Jazeera yes sir. okay so uh, for the audience members Al Jazeera is uh, a news and media platform I believe it's based out of Qatar Mm -hmm. um, Qatar is like a peninsula offshoot of Saudi Arabia. Um, for anybody that's in the military that ever watches this, there's a small island, Bahrain. Qatar is under Bahrain. I lived in Bahrain a few years ago over in the Middle East. Um, Al Jazeera, a news and media agency, is broadcasted to several Arab nations. And I don't know a lot about Al Jazeera, but they seem to be progressive. Uh, 
and it and it's funny that some of the Arab nations host Al Jazeera's content, um, given that it can be criti critical of the governments and some of the policies. Now I don't know how much of that stays in Qatar, um, and I'm I'm not sure how much of it goes to all the nations. They might filter that content. Um, in Bahrain, I picked up a lot of it. it. Is Al Jazeera making any progress like the internet does uh, with people who are tuning in in anything in regards to Islam or pro-science or anything like that? I know they do news, mm -hmm. but are they socially progressive? Do you get that impression? Well, I object to the notion that they were even progressives. So okay. Qatar itself and the, and the news station they fund Zero are all based on the Islamic Brotherhood. Yeah. They used to have, uh, and it's broadcasted throughout the, uh, the Arab world and, and all Arab speaking nations. Yeah. Uh, and now they have their own English channel too that is speaking to the people in Europe and the United States. Yeah. Mm. So uh, the, the, the channel is absolutely not progressive. <laughs> I, must, I must have misunderstood that. I I thought they well, were. I thought they were kind of uh, you know a little bit critical. They sometimes. only had one one. Re they only had one religious show, yeah. and the uh, the host there is Yusuf Al Qaradawi, the leader of the Islamic, the current leader of the whole Islamic Brotherhood right now, yeah. and uh, the one who who justified, and uh, I I don't think it was a fatwa. He just justified. Doing suicide bombing uh, in Israel right. when you do so and you kill children, it's okay because those children are going to grow up and be warriors. So it's okay to even kill them. So that was the host of the only religious show they had. If so this is the type about, of this is the guy. Yeah, this is the only guy who who was on the show as a yeah. host for a, a religious program on the on the channel. Sorry. Gotcha. And the channel itself. Like for the what they do is whatever benefits Qatar is now progressive. Whatever is not, let's not talk about this. Like for example, gotcha. the Yemeni situation. Qatar was involved in the Yemeni war. They were bombing Yemen with Saudi Arabia, and mm -hmm. that was completely fine. The moment Qatar had a conflict with Saudi Arabia, Al Jazeera was broadcasting how bad the Yemeni war is. Look at those Arab allies. They're bombing those young kids, and it's like it's. Yeah killing people in the street it's inhumane while a few months before they were the ones also bombing with those and the new station right. was like not talking about it yeah okay so do i understand correctly then and you may have already said this isn't um al jazeera commercially funded or i i think the government did before or i might even have that wrong does the government it's funded by the government of Qatar? it's funded by the see i thought it was commercially funded Oh no no no! It's it's gov uh, the government of Qatar uh, owns the station. Yeah. One of the even one of the uh, one of the suggested uh, deals to end the the problems between Saudi Arabia and Qatar is to shut down the channel. Yeah. Because it has a lot of influence in the Arab world. Right. But as a government itself, if you look at the government itself, it's clearly not, not even progressive. For example, they have a headquarter. They they opened a, an office uh, for Taliban after the war. <laughs> okay. And they were negotiating peace agreements between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Yeah. Income. You know, I kind of want to be a journalist with uh, Al Jazeera. I want to intern for like a year, man, and just. Uh, well, you, you get know. a lot of money. <laughs> I'm gonna dye my hair black. It's red right now. I probably won't go over there like that. But um, you know, hang out in the sun for a little bit. I might, I might look into that this next mm -hmm. coming year. We'll see. Uh, hey, I want to jump over to the live stream because I see a few questions going. And I don't want to miss a few because they look important. Uh, so let's jump over there real quick. Have you ever witnessed br brutality as a result of the enforcement of Sharia law? Oh yeah. So for example. Um we once, like me and a few guys from the group, we went to a house who a friend of mine told me that there's a lesbian girl who was getting beaten up there. Oh. And we got in contact with the girl and we got the girl out of the house. When she rode in the back seat, her left shoulder is just entirely black of bruises. 
her mm. face is all cuts because like it looks like somebody shoved her face into some glass or something because it's just small cuts all over her face yeah and when we got her to the family protection program which was where was recently uh, started in in the country the police officer held her id and looked at the and her to her ID, and he was uh, and because she she was wearing a hijab and got her ID, and he's like, oh no, it's, she's wearing a hijab in her ID. Can you get her a hijab so that this lady can cover up? That's his first response. He, it's not the bruises, it's not the cuts. Yeah. Like get get the hijab, let her wear it first, and then we'll talk. Yeah. So uh, that that was one of the things. What uh, our friend Khalifa Abu Khalifa is now in Canada. We got him out before his clan members were planning on killing him for being a gay and an atheist. That's double. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what else is a brutality? Um, I have a friend who lived in an area where there was a lot of Salafis, and his family itself were uh, of Salafis. Some some of his family members tried to to attack him once, and they did. I, I think. Like, I, I think. Yeah. I, he had a conflict with them on the street, and then afterwards, they were they had this clan meeting to solve the problem. And they had a debate, like they, they wanted, they wanted to talk and discuss it. And so he was, he thought that they're going to debate with him, like, like, why are you an atheist? Let's prove that uh, right. that Islam is correct. But the, the one of the guys asked him, "Give me one evidence that ISIS is wrong." Yeah. So it's not the problem of like, let's prove God to him. But like, of course, ISIS is correct. We had in Jordan, there were four thousand soldiers within ISIS, are Jordanians. So that that's like the, the I'm trying to draw a picture for you of how, how yes. it can be. So that just means you especially have to be on the lookout. <laughs> yeah. Every day. You get used to it. Like so sometimes when I when I was back in Jordan and talking to my friends who are like in, in the UK or in the United States, and I'd be like laughing because some threat like the threat message like, Oh, we're gonna come to your house, cut the babies, cut your throat and do this yeah. and that to your family and I'll be laughing and they're like well, you seem to get to gotten used to it, like because it, it turns funny to you after a while. Right and yeah, yeah. now, I'm, now when I think about it, I'm like, it shouldn't be. Like, you shouldn't have to live that way. Right, but I totally, I, 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 I get that. You know, that might be a little bit more extreme version of, you know, what all religions do if there's some sort of laws or rules against apostasy or you know, the the stigma of non-believers. Um, but yeah, that's outrageous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you, is there any a time now currently, or even specifically in the States where you hide the fact that you're a non-believer? Of course I had a few times. Well, I, first of all, nobody knows my address. Yeah. And it's danger that I don't trust. If I, an Uber guy, I sense that. It's call it racism, call it Islamophobia, but as as the life I had in Jordan, I wouldn't risk after being known too much yeah. to just with an Uber driver just stop at my house and just make it, let him know what where exactly I live. Yeah, uh, you always go to the neighbor you don't like, and you get picked <laughs> up and dropped off there. <laughs> so there there were uh, I I don't give my full name. To strangers, because you never know. Like you, you, ha you might have it here. You might have it anywhere. Although the risk is too much lower here, but it still exists. You still carry that sentence on you since you decided to leave. So you never know when. The, but people had it in in the, in Holland and in, in, in the Netherlands. People had it in Denmark. People had it in Paris. People had it in the UK. There was nine eleven, for example. Not all of them are, are, are apostates, but all of them are supposed to die by sharia law so they did deliver that sentence to them what makes me so special that i won't have that sentence carried on me while i'm in the united states so i should take my measures to just stay safe all right so muhammad help me out because sometimes i see advocates for islam mm -hmm. that just paint a picture where everything is rosy and i have a hard time reconciling the, the two stories that I hear, now I know what I seen when I was in the Middle East and from what I could get as an outsider was not anything that made me feel comfortable when I would, let's say, be taking a stroll through a black alley 
what I know as black alleys, um, you know, through or near the souks um, in uh, Manama in over in Bahrain. And for the audience, a black galley, wish I could pull up a screen share here. Um, I'll paint the picture. Is where you have uh, religious flags. They're black. I don't know how to read Arabic, um, but the religious flags, they're black. You walk through an alley. This is a black alley. And then they have religious scenes depicted in booths. And usually there's always one in there which is violent. And um, it has something to do with sacrifice or I don't, I don't really know. Um, but we were warned to never go into these black alleys. And uh, I did all the time. <laughs> but the times when um, the areas were populated and I got near those black alleys, um, I was not welcome there. Uh, I was stared down. Um, you know, it's, it's what you might imagine, you know, a, a more fair skinned person mm -hmm. over in, you know, Arab world about to go into one of those places. I don't know. You might be able to tell me what the consequences could possibly have been, mm -hmm. but that's my experience. Now I have Muslim friends who are moderates. Okay. Like most Christians are moderates. You know, the, most people exist in the moderate part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. It's only the things that we notice are on the, the far, the extreme ends mm -hmm. of those spectrums. Those are the things that we notice. All right. So back to that, help me out. Why, why is Islam rosy and peaceful, but also, um, you know, the, the bad things that we hear in the news or the things that we're told, uh, you know, in hearsay, things not to do, or we're going to get in trouble. Well, the difference between Islam and other faiths is that it's inherently political. It's not just the word of God that, like, I died for your sins and all of that bullshit. It's God wants a nation for himself. Yeah. A nation with rules he will dictate. And he want, and the, glo the, the glorious thing you can ever do for that God is to be a soldier in his army of his country. So... This is the, the highest rank you'll ever be. So it depends on how devout are you. So if you're the normal guy who prays five times a day and don't give a damn about creating that, you're completely the moderate, peaceful, rosy guy. So but before you paint too much more of a picture, I just want to point something out so that our audience is aware, and then you can continue painting your picture. The five, the five pillars of mm -hmm. Islam, faith, prayer, charity, fasting, in Mecca, taking a pilgrimage to Mecca. Those are the five pillars um, of Islam. And that might be specific uh, to one or the other side, or maybe to both. I, I don't no, know. It's both. It's a both. Okay. Um, to the bo both sides of Islam. All right. So how do you go from the five pillars of faith, which there's nothing wrong with that, to the spectrum of which you're about to paint that picture? How do you, how do you go from something that's like good, you know, whatever, mm -hmm to it being a political disturbance on the world stage? Well, these five are your personal interaction with God. Okay. So when, you, when you're giving away money for charity, you're not doing it to help the poor. You're doing it to get the reward from, from Allah. I see. He's going like, to give you rewards in, in heaven for, for what, what he did. So you're not yeah. even trying to help the poor. So... These are actually, when you pray, you pray for God. When you do the, all of that, you do, you do it for God. In order for you to be a Muslim, you have to do all those five. You don't have to fight. You don't have to be a terrorist. You don't have yeah. to, to do all of that. But there, there are two types of jihad. The first is jihad al-ayn, jihad al and the second is jihad al-talab. So jihad al-talab is, uh, for example, let's say there was a caliphate. And this caliphate is invading another country. It's mm. not the duty of every single Muslim in the planet to just go and fight. It's yeah. if only a selected few are enough to be in that army. That's fair. All is good. You're not. You're not gonna get into hell or have negative uh, consequences with God because of you staying home. Yeah. The other form of jihad is uh, is jihad al ain. It means jihad that jihad that is forced on everyone is when a land is occupied, a land of Islam that belongs to Islam, is occupied oh. by a foreign force. 
that makes it a jihad ayn for everybody. So if you go deep, that's what I mentioned, is that how, how devout are you is what inclines you to do such acts. Because yeah. if you go deep into the faith, you would say like, oh, like we're not in a time where it's jihad al We're in a time where it's jihad al ayn We got Palestine issue, we got Iraq issues, we got Afghanistan, we got the Philippines. The, when when Eastern, uh, Eastern War got, got its independence from Indonesia, it was sort of like, oh, even though it's a majority of Christians, but this land used, it was, it used to be a part of an Islamic country. So let's now bomb the UN in Baghdad because of what they did in Indonesia. Okay. They, they, they've taken a part, of, the, a part of, of an Islamic land from us. So that made it the jihad ayn. Let's fight them everywhere we find them. So basically the world stage right now, depending on um, the, the uh, intensity of the devotee to their faith, they can certainly find themselves in either one or the other types of jihad. Mm. Yeah, and, and uh, for example, let's say there is somebody who believes completely in the Bible. Yeah. Okay, that it's the literal word of God. Yeah. They can never be a hypocrite and like just neglect one verse or, or another. Would yeah. that create a terrorist? Uh, in, in my opinion, yes, absolutely. Well, that's the same thing about the Quran and Islam. But yeah. because it's a sensitive subject, you're not allowed to say so. But just take Christianity, for example, and implement the same things and the same ideas. You'll get terrorists who are fundamental Christians. But if it, you talk about fundamental Muslim terrorists, you're a racist. So it's just because it's sensitive doesn't make it false. Yeah. Well, so okay. that's why there's a, millions and millions of people who are or peaceful because they're they're not if you put your morality if it's only based on the prophet only based on the quran and you believe that every word is true mm. you get what you what, what you have seen already seen. it's not something that you will see it's already it's already happened okay so let's go there then let's go to the quran let's go to the holy scriptures why are there and, and this might be uh to the benefit more maybe of our uh, Muslim viewership that might ever see this video. Why are there two sects of Islam? Why did a divergence happen? Why the split? What, what's up? What are the two sects called? It wasn't. It wasn't based on the. It wasn't based on uh, on the Quran itself. It was right. yeah. uh, after the death of the Prophet. Uh, first of all, actually, about the names, it's the Sunnis and the Shiites. But there's a yeah. lot of sects. But these are the two major ones. So. <clears throat> The, after the death of the prophet, there were talk, uh, people who were, who were with him were, were talking about who's going to lead us right now, what's going to happen. So uh, the majority went and met in a place called Saqifat ibn Sa'idah to discuss who's going to be the, uh, the next caliph hmm. or, or who's going to lead the, the nation right now. The, the prophet, I, I know that the, 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 the the word in English, uh, the nephew, the husband of, of his daughter. So his, so his son in law. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So his son in law, his son in law stayed with him, with the dead body. They were like washing him, getting him ready to, for the funeral. Yeah. And afterwards, the, the guys who were meeting proclaimed Abu Bakr as a caliph. Yeah. Now, that guy wasn't even in the meeting. And his followers are like, uh, say that he should be the caliph. He's the one related to the prophet. He's married to his daughter. There's a lot of signs and hadith that talk about him. So anyway, that caliph ruled for two years. Another caliph came. A third caliph came. The third one got assassinated. And also the second one. But the third one, when the third one got assassinated, that son of law became the caliph. Mm -hmm. And there were an Arabic conflict between two clans, Bani Umayya and Bani Hashim. So that guy is from Bani Hashim. The, the third caliph who got assassinated was from Bani Umayya. So all of the Bani Umayyas started to, to get themselves distant from, the, from Ali, who's the son of law of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And that created some tension because he didn't go immediately to force punishments on those who assassinated the third one. 
and that created the first battle where the, uh, the, the youngest wife, Aisha of Muhammad, was on one side of the army with, with her fellow uh, followers of the Prophet, and where Ali, the new caliph, with his own followers of the Prophet, was on the second hand of the, of the army. That was the, the first battle that happened, and that's what created the split between them. So it's a political step, uh, political slip rather than a, a theological one. But it did create some theological differences, but still it's political, like who should rule? Is yeah. it from a bloodline of Muhammad or is it whoever the nation picks? Right, yeah. So if and from what I stand from what I understand on the theological side, if we could call it that, is um one side is able to wield the authority or interpretation of the Quran because they are part of the bloodline. And the other might hold the position, you don't have to be a part of the bloodline. Um, the Quran stands for itself, uh, and then we, but we can still rule over here. Have I mischaracterized anything, or is that in a nutshell? Well, no, it's, it's, it's correct to a degree. The, the Shiites believe that those who are the imams from the bloodline of Muhammad have this special knowledge given to them by God, that they yeah. can interpret the, the Quran. While uh, the school of the Sunni sect says, like, the Quran is already there. Nobody has any special powers or special knowledge. If we just study it, uh, we already know Arabic. If we, if we can use evidence, we can uh, take all of the rulings we'll ever need from the Quran and the Hadith. So basically, one sect believes that there's only one supernatural human who's the prophet. Yeah. Well, the other side believes there are 12 supernatural humans. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to draw any unnecessary parallels between Islam and Christianity. But I can't help but think, okay, one side sounds Catholic and the other side sounds Protestant. Mm. <laughs> it's funny how we humans just kind of fall into these cycles. No, 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 no. I want the power. I deserve the power because after all... Um, I'm blood, and I was there, and uh, you know, and then the other side is like, wait, 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 no, because we are discussing actual content that's available to all of us. Why shouldn't the content be its own authority here? Um, we choose to not observe. You're special because of your blood, um, and now we're gonna fight you uh, for this position of political power. Is really what it's about. And um, you know, there was a time in Christianity where only certain people. Only the elite could uh, convey the message of the Christian God. Well, now that's done, we, you can't do that anymore today. I mean, who respects the Pope like they did a thousand years ago? Mm -hmm. um, we, we all have these source materials now. And by the way, uh, we've created thousands upon thousands of denominations. We have so diluted what is the Christian religion over um, 1500 years that it is essentially in the protestant world powerless with its theology uh, there's no hierarchy really it's just who do you choose to give your money to <laughs> yeah. you know um the vatican looks you know more and more empty every time i i take a look at it i could be wrong on that maybe i'm looking at the wrong pictures um okay so, all right, I feel like we got. This is interesting. This is, uh, you, you can also apply this to, to the same questions uh, you asked me previously. You have all of these dominations. You have all these sects. You have all yeah. of these people who are peaceful. And still, when I ask you if somebody completely believes in the Bible, yeah, with all the actions that are required for sodomy, for for all all of those laws, yeah, uh, the Old Testament and the New. You said that there would possibly be Christian terrorists. So that's yeah. that's completely what I, what I'm trying to convey within Islam. There's a lot of sects, a lot of people, a lot of people who don't even pray right now. Most yeah. people don't pay the zakat because who wants to pay money? Yeah. yeah. But but still, if you believe in the literal word of God, you would possibly possibly engage in such violence. Right. I don't really think there's many people would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm just going to throw this out there and I'd, I'd be interested to read the comments later. 
Um, but the people who think that if you are a fundamentalist Christian, that you are a peaceful, loving person, this couldn't be further from the edicts of the Christian Bible. Wait, like, have you read it? Um, and that's part of why people deconvert from religion is because they actually start educating themselves on their own religion's sacred texts. Mm -hmm. Text, by the way, that was written by man, edited by man, copied by man, um, compiled by man, uh, distributed by man. There's no part of our religious or sacred texts ever. And we know this, the scholars on both sides know this, that came from anything other than humans. So whereas we take our doctrine, which is the edicts, the things that we learn to do in our religious behavior from human texts, at what point do we presume God was ever a part of that and why? And that, let me put this back on you now. So you're an ex-Muslim. For the Muslims that will see this in the future, why should they trust you, Muhammad? That you that you have the correct way or a better way? Why should they trust you? That's what I, I what I always tell any Muslim I, I talk with is that don't take me for my word. Just go there. You have that access that mm. I have. You can access these books. You can access history, and just look at the lies that we were told when we were kids, over and over again until we believe them, and just look at them. You don't, don't take my word, don't take the imam's word, don't take the preacher word, don't mm. take anybody. Make your own thoughts based on your own knowledge because the, uh, the highest percentage of people who are religious are religious because of their parents, not because they made their own decision. Uh, I, I, and I would completely respect someone who was an atheist at one point and just decided to be a Muslim. Hooray to you. Like, have fun. But... Make your own decisions. Make your own truth. Believe in it. Look for it. If you don't even ever find it, well, that might lead you to be an atheist because you might never find the truth. Yeah. Or an agnostic, at least. If you do find whatever suits you as a truth and you don't infringe it on others, well, go ahead. Don't don't take my words on it. It's all. I, I'm not. I'm not making things up. You can look at it, look at them and read them. For example, I was once talking about uh, people, uh, Jews who got killed in the Medina where Muhammad was there. So they, he exterminated the whole tribe of them mm. at that day. So what, one of them, my Muslim friends were asking me like, no, this is bullshit. You're lying. Yeah. Well, I was like, okay, well, how do you know by Islamic law? How do you know that a man is now a man, not a boy? And yeah. he's like, well, by Islamic law, we know that if he grows puberty hair, so I was like, okay, well, what, where did that law come from? He's like, I don't know. Well, okay, let's go back to that law. Let's open the books and read where that, the, this law came from. When they decided to kill all the Jews of that, of that tribe, they were like, okay, take the women and children as slaves and kill the men. So mm -hmm. one of the kids was 14. So they were like, oh, shall we take this guy as a slave or kill him? So they were like, check if he has hair. If he does have hair, then he's he's a man, so he get, he get, get killed. They checked him; he doesn't have hair, so he he was now a slave. That's how we got the Islamic rule. Mm -hmm. That's how we know in Sharia if a guy is a man or a, or a, or a kid by the fatwas. So where did the fatwas come from? From history. If you go yeah. read it, you'll find out. Right. It makes me want to shave my face when I go over there. <laughs> You're pretty hair. Hey, well, you know, I was just going to say shave my face, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to try to go back over into the from here. We've got a question and then we'll close, close this out. Mohammed, what do you think about the fundamental Christians in the U.S. and about uh, their position of power in government right now? Do you have any opinions? Well, I thought that I'm on the... I'm completely opposite of everything that the right has or everything that is central. And I was like completely left when I was back in Florida. But yeah. when I came here, I started to to read and see some things that are upsets 
me and then uh, so I don't I don't consider myself with any of uh, of those directions. Yeah. But I've I've seen I've seen some uh, Christians here. I've seen some some weird things like people who are trying just like Muslims do. Like uh, when a Muslim guy tells like a woman that she has a little bit of hair appearing, like oh sister, you have to cover up. I've seen a lot where people are like, oh, Jesus is the Lord. If you in front of their kids, like they're yeah. preaching to, to, to a, they, one guy preached to a woman in front of her kids and telling her kids to tell their mommy that the Lord will send her to hell because she's not accepting Jesus and, and all of that. I've seen racism a little bit. Yeah. I've seen fundamentalism a little bit, but still free believe that I'm completely free here. And regarding government, well, I do believe that it's the most secular country there is right now. Uh, it's the most free country there is right now. It's the, yeah. the only country I'm proud to have my its flag behind me. Yeah. Uh, you do have freedom of speech, of hate, of offending. You do have freedom to to defend yourself, you have freedom to be uh, to, to to be treated as equal mm. by the government, not by entities or like they, people can discriminate against you based on religion or otherwise, but still by the government itself they just can't. Mm. And having that supreme law that treats people as equal, although at one point it was made by the white man for the white for the white people. Yeah, but for us, by that, us. That's what that, we like to say. That value <laughs> is now is now for everyone. So although yeah. something, if if a good thing comes from a bad situation, it doesn't make it bad. So if, for example, um, uh, freedom of speech, let's say, was created, let's assume that it was created just for white men. Yeah. Well, now we all have it as an option. It doesn't make it as a bad thing just because it was created in a bad situation. Yeah. That's why I appreciate the government. I appreciate the country. I appreciate its values, even though I might not like the political parties of it, of it but still, the, the Constitution itself is amazes me. That's encouraging to hear. Yeah, that's encouraging to hear. I hope everybody that's listening right now and watches this in the future also feels encouraged. How can you not? If you've been overseas, especially in a place, a culture not your own, um, you realize all the things you do appreciate about the culture from which you came. Uh, in this case, for me, uh, being the USA, when I was living in the Middle East, there was beautiful things about the Middle East that I loved. In fact, it's probably one of my favorite places in the world. But then again, you know, I uh, I didn't get into any trouble. So mm. um, interesting place to me. But yeah, uh, you're right, Muhammad. We are protected here, probably more so than uh, a lot of places around the world. We shouldn't take that for granted. So uh, thanks for reminding us of that. Mohammed. do you have any special projects going on right now, and where can people find you? Well, I'm on Twitter as Alcadra69, and uh, there's a website called Ex-Muslims of Joe. That's ex-Muslim of Joe. That's the Council of Ex-Muslims of Jordan, which we are trying to collaborate with all the councils in North America and in Europe to try to help, especially people in refugee situations. Mm. Um, I'm also on Facebook too, under my name. And that's uh, uh, about to be the only project I have right now. Okay. Awesome. All right. Everybody watching, thank you for tuning in. If you're watching right now, go ahead and hit that like button to support conversations like these to support fully deconverted and to support Mohammed in all his efforts. Um, you might not know it, but people who watch videos just like this, they can watch it in a point in their life where it's life changing for them. It acts as a catalyst for them to go to one place, which might not be the best place in their life, uh, to act as a bridge and go somewhere else. So um, hit that like button, make sure you subscribe, go find Mohammed, see what um, he's got going on. We will plug. Um, any of his links or something, uh, what he's got going on over on our dot com. So look for that in the next couple of days. That said, thank you for everybody's attention. I'm R.L. Lavinu. This was Muhammad. Muhammad, say goodbye. Thank you.
you. Thank you, everyone, for having me, and thanks for your audience. Bye. -bye.